Uh, please op- get your Bible out, open up to Acts chapter 2. And as you're going there, I'll give you a quick recap of what our goal is here. Um, two years ago, we worked through an authentic community series, an eight-week series, as part of my degree program. And uh, we thought it would be good to not only do a review, um, but an application of some of the primary teachings. What we don't want to do, we don't want to do this with any teachings of the Word of God to learn it, understand it, and then not do it. That's horrible. Uh, But it's particularly bad when it's community. (laughs) You gather and we learn about community, we talk about community, but we don't exercise community. So we don't want to be hypocrites that way. Um, Jesus said very clearly, John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you what? Say it, that you love one another, right? Even as I have loved you, and then he repeats it, that you also love one another. Um, And so we talked last two weeks ago, we talked about the, an imperative is an imperative. A command is a command. And so what we don't want to do in the Western world is elevate certain commands and diminish others. We want to approach the Word of God. In fact, if we have time, we probably won't tonight. But a passage we're going to look at actually would invert that. And they would take our love for God and our love for one another, and they would elevate those over some of the commands that we hold so sacred in our cultural moment. Um, So the the goal would be... um, the definition which we looked at in some detail last time, um, the, the five biblical foundations of authentic community, what my, my hope is that we can look at these passages in detail, pull out the, the main theme of each, and then have you reflect, we already did Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, what it means to be devoted, and some of you wrote those things down. I want to actually kick off with that. Um, so when we think about what does an authentic community look like, what does the Bible teach to it? These are just five basic passages. There are dozens that you could pick if you wanted to um, try to better understand how we're supposed to live. We go to God's word for what reason? If we want to know about God, biblical community, why do we go to God's word? Why? Why don't we talk about community culturally or community historically? Why do we go here? It's not, it's not a trick question. No, I, I like plumb line. So when we went through hermeneutics, we talked about how, how do we know how to live? How do we know how to relate? The scriptures teach us that, right? So we want to go to the word of God to see what it looks like to be in a biblical community and then by the Holy Spirit actually do it, Right? And so we looked last week at Acts chapter 2, a devoted community, authentic communities are marked by a devotion to the things of God, his word, communion, prayer, and a devotion to one another. So let me, let's just work through really quickly um, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. 42 is the base. It gives us the four primary aspects of what it means to be devoted. And then we see the, um, the results of that in verses 43 to 47. I'm just going to read and comment as we go along, and then I want to hear some of the things that you wrote down if you were here two weeks ago. So <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, if you, if you remember, we're, we're um, post-Pentecost. Peter preached a sermon. Multitudes came to a saving grace, and then this is the, the, the result of that, verse 42. And they, speaking of the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayers. And we looked at that word devoted. It's single-mindedness. It is being focused on these things. The teachings, which we would say is the word of God. Fellowship, which we defined as something more than eating food together. We said that was striving or working together. The breaking of bread, which was both communion and over a meal. And then the prayers would be the total prayers. Okay. And so the question I had you ask is, on your sheet, how can I can be a more devoted member at CCC by what? And specifically, I, I want you to contemplate, um, is it a, a greater submission to the word of God? Or is it a greater striving together with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Or is it breaking bread, you know, receiving communion, a fellowship meal, and then people in your home? Or is it prayer? 
Um, so as you think about that, just look with me again at verses 43 to 47. The results of this devotion were extraordinary. Verse 43, and awe came upon every soul. What, what do you think it was that caused awe and wonder in the context of the church in Jerusalem? What was it about the, what, what made it awesome? What do you think it was? Mm -hmm. And when you come together to worship the Lord, there is a sense of like it's it's very powerful and we know there is not how powerful it is and why it's important. Yeah. So they were experiencing a supernatural element, awe and wonder to the gathering. So I want you to just think to yourself, is that what we experience when we gather? Is there a supernatural component to our gathering? Awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. So there was a great unity and there was a great commonality. Verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And so there was a mutual care. It sounds a lot like what? What's that? No, not socialism, Tim. Somebody whack him for me, will you? If you're close enough. No, it wasn't socialism. So we know we, we, we talked to this, but in the context of the New Testament church, many could not go back. This was the church, so they stayed. And so those in the church made sure that those who were in need actually, I know you were kidding, Tim, that were in need, just so you know that Tim's not a socialist, um, they stayed and they had all things in common. It sounds a lot like family. They were together. They had things in common. They were meeting each other's needs. Right? It sounds like a good family, actually. It sounds like the kind of family you want to be a part of. Mutual care for one another. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in the homes. It's really interesting. You notice that? There was both a large gathering and a smaller gathering. Why do you think churches do community groups? You have larger gatherings on the Lord's Day and you have smaller gatherings in the home. And they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they were glad in heart, they were worshiping God, and they were a testimony to the world. What brought this about? It goes back to verse 42. Verse 42 actually is a thesis statement for this passage. They were devoted to the teachings, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Those, those defined that community. So um, take a minute. If you didn't do this last week, we only got to a couple people, but I really want to hear this. I would like this to be a piece of our time together over the next few weeks where we hear each other, we can pray for each other, and, and hopefully encourage one another to make changes. Where do you struggle with most in your devotion? Word of God, fellowship, breaking bread, or prayer? Where is it? Share with us. We can pray for you. We're all square on all four. Brandon? Who would like to pray for Brandon? So when, when we're looking at these, Brandon's success in prayer in the context of community is your success in prayer. Brandon's struggle in prayer as a body of Christ is your struggle. So if Brandon says, you know what, I really want to grow in this area 
and you're like, yeah, I hope you do well or I'll pray for you as though it has no impact on you, then we're missing an essential part of community. So who would like to pray for Brandon to be better at being devoted to prayer that he might bless all of us? Who would like to pray for Brandon? I would like for short prayers here lifted up, but I would like to um, practice some of these basic things. Thank you, Jonathan. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Who else? Teaching, fellowship, bread, prayer. That you say, hey, I, I need to. Some of these other passages we'll look at. Um, your spiritual health impacts the spiritual health of the whole body of Christ. Your spiritual sickness impacts the sickness of the body of Christ. There is no you alone in Jesus, independent of this gathering, if you're a member here. Andrea? Yep. Okay. How many of you can identify with what Andrea just said? Yeah, okay. So, who would like to pray for Andrea and all of us who just raised our hands? Mom, thank you. Amen. How about teaching fellowship or breaking of bread? An area you can be more devoted to and in so doing, not only be blessed, but bless the church. Yeah, good. Good. Thank you, Lexi. So we see the breaking of bread both in the context of communion and the larger breaking of bread in the homes. Um, I like the way you put that, that it's not a show, right? Um, so if we, if we get down dirty, if we truly are family... My brothers are coming over. I'm not going to do anything with my house. I, I don't care what they think. You know, in that context, it's not, they're my brothers, right? And it should be the same with us, that we should be okay, right? With whatever that looks like or whatever the anxieties we have in our cultural moment and just having people coming in and out all the time. Um, so breaking bread in the home, who would like to pray for Lexi and all of us so that we just love having people around, right? Who would like to pray for Lexi? Tim, thank you.
one another as we reveal to then live out being one another like Christ said on the cross. Father, I, I ask this for all here to be comfortable, willing, and open to be real with one another, not hiding behind a veil and just having brothers and sisters, having family over to share, to sit, to talk, to laugh, to cry. Father, we ask this that uh, you open this body to one another like this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Um, Dave and Andrea, um, Dave contacted me, I think, Monday morning, right? He said, hey, what are you guys doing tonight? And we're like, oh, nothing. And I see we get together, yeah. Came out, had dinner. Love spontaneity. You, we, we've said it to you before. Anytime you're, you can all just come by. I mean, you know, Laura usually, she's still cooking for like eight people. So if you come, you can help us eat our food. Let, let me do this really quick because I, I do want to get to 1 Corinthians 12 tonight. <clears throat> what happens if we're not devoted as a community of believers to the teachings? What happens? The teachings being the word of God. The apostolic teachings being what we have codified in the canon. What happens if we as a body of believers are not devoted to the word of God? There are several things that can happen. Yep, false worship. Dangerous. Good. Loses the value of the importance, right, if we're going to just, you know, forsake these teachings. Yep. Guaranteed that's going to happen. False teaching, false doctrine, not even knowing how to relate to one another properly. What happens if we're not devoted to fellowship? If we're thinking about how we, how we actually exercise a robust, authentic, biblical community, if we forsake fellowship, what's the impact? Become isolated. Good. Yep. Good. Yep. Yep. It's so that type of isolation, which is what we experience in the Western Church, is it just decimates everything. We can just stop talking because there's we can't talk about biblical community and not have koinonia and not have biblical fellowship. Brandon. Yep. The most dangerous thing being what? In light of our study in Revelation. You don't, know Christ. you don't know Christ. You don't persevere to the end. You are damned. That's real. We, we saw that in the book of Hebrews. Five times in Hebrews it talks about the danger of falling away as a result of not being an active, vibrant part of a family. A Christian family. What about we don't break bread? What happens to a church that doesn't break bread together? Remember we talked we talked last time what is the what is the importance of breaking bread? What does breaking bread do? Even even in the western culture, even as whacked as we are when it comes to eating, we still get it. Right? That's that's just part of how God made us to eat together. What happens when you share a meal with somebody? Even if it's a really bad meal. Yeah, I mean, you do, right? You're sitting, right? There's intimacy automatically. You're, you're engaged in an intimate act when you're sitting at a table eating food, right? So you take the bread away and you take one of the primary components of intimacy away. Well, it's hard to be a true family without intimacy. My, my mom and dad were so good we ate, well, in part because my youngest brother was a diabetic, so we ate every night at six o'clock. And there was an expectation that the entire, I had three brothers, so there were six of us would be around the table, and we were at the table every night at six o'clock. 
And I, I didn't get it at the time, but in retrospect, that, those were just huge. You know, seven days a week, every day for your whole life until I left the house, right? And, there, and it built intimacy, right? So breaking bread is necessary. It's not optional. Um, what about the prayers? And, and it says the prayers, and there's debate on what prayers they were talking about. I, I, I have landed on the position that it included prayers in the temple, it included prayers in the homes, and it con- con- included personal prayer. That it's the prayers total. So what happens when a church is not a praying church in the context of community? When you pray for brothers and sisters in Christ, doesn't it cultivate a love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Jonathan was telling me that he and Lexi, they, they, they work through um, the, uh, come on, what's my, I'm drawing a blank here, the, the directory, thank you, the membership directory. And there's something about seeing someone's face and praying. I mean, they may not know you're praying, but God knows you're praying, and your heart's being kindled for them, and then when you see them, you know, you've thought about them, you've prayed for them, and now you're going to want to talk to them, right? Uh, a church that's not going to be praying for one another and together, again, we can throw the whole thing out. We will not have biblical community if we are not praying, right? Because it's, it's our unity in Christ, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and therefore prayer is one of those aspects of glue that glues us together, Yeah. Good. Agreed. So, devotion to these four basic elements are necessary if our church decides to be a communal church. I mean, we we don't want to be hypocrites with our own name now, right? We are now what Christ. Community church. And so ask yourself, hopefully as you're jotting these things down, be praying for that, be sharing that in your discipleship groups and asking God to help you grow in that area. Help you grow in your devotion to the word of God, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. Um, the second passage, please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a chapter most of you know well. It's the chapter that most people go to when they talk about gifts in the body, the use of gifts in the body what it means to be a member of the body, um, what it means to be a body in terms of unity. Um, So my argument is that a church that is going to be authentic in community is a devoted church. A church that's going to be authentic in community is an interconnected church, an interconnected church, an interdependent church, dependent one to another. So authentic communities are interdependent communities where members of a local body live interconnected, interdependent lives. What do I mean by that before we actually get to 1 Corinthians 12? Give me a one-sentence summary statement. You're like, let me read the passage and then I'll tell you. That's not, not bad. <clears throat> Summary statement. Come and give me one. George is trying to give us one. He's making an effort. Except we don't speak Babanese. Yeah, what, what, is, what does it mean to be interdependent, interconnected? 
And not just from a biblical standpoint, just in general. No, no, I need you, you need me, we need each other. We need. That's right. So it's interdependent. We are dependent upon one another. Not optional. Not optional. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you would go with me if you're not already there. Um, the Apostle Paul, toward the end of his letter, he had talked about head coverings. Um, in chapter 11, he begins, ends chapter 11, dealing with the Lord's Supper, and then he moves into chapter 12, dealing with the spiritual gifts. Um, at the very beginning, he talks about the variety of gifts coming from the same spirit. And then he describes, he describes the church, the body of Christ in verses 12 through 27. And again, I'd like to just walk through this with you, um, making a few editorial notes and then um, have us examine ourselves in light of it. Um, so the question you're going to be asking yourself is, Am I dependent upon my brothers and sisters here? Do I live like that? And do I really believe they're dependent upon me? And do I live like that? I'm, I'm helping others, and they need me to help them. And others are helping me, and I need them to help me. So think of it in the context of interdependence. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, he's now describing the, the construction of the church, the nature of the church, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. So he begins in verse 12, and he gives us an analogy, and the analogy is what? It's physical body, right? So you're thinking arms, legs, eyes, ears, toes. It's a physical analogy, right? And it's, he's now describing, or he's going to describe, use that, to describe the church. So it is with Christ. So it is with the body, of Christ, verse 13. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, notice the emphasis here, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So in verse 13, one spirit, one body, one spirit, s- several times, the emphasis being what? <laughs> one, 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 what's the emphasis? The emphasis is unity, right? So we certainly see in the context of 1 Corinthians 12, the description of the body is an interdependent body that is unified. We are one. Keep reading verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member but many. And you say, now wait a minute. We're one body but many members. Therefore, there's unity and what? Unity and diversity, right? Unity and diversity in the context of the body. We are one body, but within that one body, there are many parts of which you make up one of those parts. Verse 15, if the foot should say, it's always funny that, I don't know why he starts with the foot. I, yeah, there's speculation as to why he starts the foot, but most people don't say, I want to be a foot. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. Notice that key word, any less, in verse 15, any less in verse 16, the emphasis that Paul's making what? If you're a member of the body, you're a member of the body. You're not any less, no matter what part you are. Toe, ear, eye, it does not matter. You are a member of the body, right? So he's showing the unity and diversity and necessity of every single body part. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? I remember when I was studying this in detail, one of the commentators said, what a horrific thought, right? That the only part is an eye. And he just described this massive eyeball, right? That's all it was, and he talked about it being grotesque, and he's right, but it's not that. We have multiple parts that make up the beautiful body of Christ. So then he says in verse 18, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. Verse 18 is such an extraordinary verse. I don't know why we don't just sit on it for weeks and weeks. 
What is that verse saying? God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. And I do believe he's speaking to local churches, not the Catholic Universal Church. What does that mean? What does that mean about you being a member here? <laughs> My mom just said that this is where he placed us. He said, no, 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 no. No, no, I went through the nine marks and the founders and pillar and I searched. And, and I, I looked at several websites. I listened to sermons, went to several places. I went there, I went here. And we decided, I decided that I was going to come here and join this church. It says God arranged the members each one of them, as he chose, (laughs) right? So, of course, he used your wisdom and your search to bring you to the exact place that he so decreed. What makes that, if we just talk about God's decreeing body parts in general, what makes that so incredible? I mean, just incredible, Brandon. <laughs> yeah. So no one's you're not here by you're not here by accidentally, right? So you serve a purpose. In in people leaving, this is always a verse I go to. We need to be very careful if you've been brought to a church to pack up your bags and go to the church down the street. And then the church down the street. Right? It's a big deal that God decrees these things. And so what he's doing, this is such an amazing thought and a beautiful thought. Um, Very similar to how husband and wife have children and God decrees what that family is going to look like. He does the same thing for every true local body of believers. He decrees what that family will look like. Who's going to be in it? Who's not going to be in it? It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Look at verse 19. If all were a single member, where would the body be? So Paul's saying we need diversity. We need multiple members to make up the one body. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So diversity and unity again. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. And so again, there's just this radical interdependence of the members. Now we we get that when it comes to our physical bodies, right? If, If a part of your body is not doing well, a little tiny, tiny piece have you ever had a blister on your pinky toe you know if you if you've done sports you know you're trying to break in your cleats what is that blister that little tiny blister on your pinky toe what does it do to you it's debilitating i mean it's so pathetic it's your skin rubbed off on the littlest appendage on your foot and you can barely walk and you're even embarrassed to say it so what's wrong with you oh, i got a i got a blister on my pinky toe it's like oh okay you look like you're gonna die the littlest piece of the body is necessary, and then Paul says, important as well. Look at verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Verse 23, and on those parts of the body um, that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and so we, in, in honoring the, what, what we would consider weaker, it's only weaker culturally, we actually lift them up. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, verse 24, which are our more presentable parts do not require. So people are getting the attention. They don't need that type of honor because they're already getting it. And then he, he closes at the latter part of verse 24, but God so composed the body. So again, going back to verse 18, he decreed it, giving greater honor to the part that lacked that there may be no division in the body. So again, a strong call to unity each part being necessary, dependent, and important, but that the members have the same care for one another. So no partiality, right? I mean, that would be a horrible thing in a community, in a family. We're gonna really care for these people because you know, they got some really important gifts and they need to stay healthy. And then these, you know, these toes over here you know, and these toenails over here, they participate, but if, you know, if we lose them, it's no big deal. So we'll treat these people with great honor and these with less. Well, that would be an ugly family, right? And yet, not uncommon in the church today, right? Where we lift up some and we diminish others. Even if we don't say it, we do that in how we treat people. Um, And then he closes, verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And so again, 
concluding this thought with radical unity. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Do you notice that? That statement, it's indicative. Verse 27, it's a fact. He's saying it's a fact. You are the body of Christ. It's a fact. You're a member of the body of Christ. You are what? You are needed. You're needed. Okay, so radical interdependence in the context of God's church. So ask, answer the question that I had there. How can I can be a more interdependent member at CCC by what? What will enable you, equip you to be more interdependent? That, going back to the beginning statement, you living as though you need others because you do, and you serving others because they need you. What can you do to be a more interdependent member of the body here? What do you need to do? Be present? Be present? Yes. It's so simple, right? But, you know, if you're a needed body part and you're not around... Well, it makes it very, very difficult. I would say, Mom, that that's the number one indication, perpetual absence from the body, that at least that individual body part does not see their need to be around other members. <laughs> Either they think they don't need it or they think that we don't need it, and both are wrong. So presence I can be more interdependent member at CCC by being present. What else? Tim. I'm sorry, William. Good. Sure. Good. Thank you, brother. Tim? Sorry. Good. So why do you say humbly honest in order to serve and be served? What's the connection between that? What's the phrase that needs to come out of our mouths? I need help. Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? I need, I need your help. I need you to pray for me. I need you to come to my house. I need you to help me. How do we do with that, honestly? How, how are you with that? And that's so countercultural. That's so not Western thinking, right? You ask when are you... You're like desperate. <laughs> You've tried everything and you can't do it alone or you can't do it with that other person and now, and then you finally reach out. Well, that's just pathetic, right? We talked about family. Family is to be present and available, right? So a call at any time. Good. What else? Thank you, Tim. Interdependence. Where does it need to start? I'll ask you another question. How many of you truly believe that your faith, your sanctification, and your perseverance to the end is contingent upon the body of Christ? How many of you really believe that? That take the body away, you become desanctified, and you may perish. I mean, really, I, I know you said, well, I know, I, I, I've, I heard you pe- preach through Hebrews. I know that, but do you know that? Because we really believe that if we're what? If we're living like we're interdependent, if we're constantly in each other's lives because we need each other. 
not just we say it, we say, yes, of course, of course. In many other places throughout the world, in many other communal cultures that have communal churches, they think that how we do church is hysterical, that it's not real church. I think I shared with you last week, an underground church in China, they laughed wanting to know whether or not we read the same Bible because of the way we do church, that it's not real interdependence. It's quasi or marginal or a little bit or not at all. I mean, dependent on one another. Tina. Good. Yep. And yes, they might be alone with you in a very hostile place, but they need to know that you are here together praying. And, and, and that's going to be very intimidating to you. Remember, all of us, that's really the concept of it. Yeah. No, it's a, great, it's a great example. And that's true for each and every one of us here, right? So we can import that to our local mission field and how desperately we need each other, praying for each other, serving each other, loving each other. Brandon, thank you, Tina. Yeah, and kind of similar to both what Tim and Tina said, um, realizing how dependent we are in not only confessing our sins, but then depend upon other brothers and sisters of the Spirit, like showing us our sin, yep. teaching us, exhorting us, rebuking us. Yep. Um, because when we're doing it by ourselves, we're not going to see that. We're not going to be able to know it very well. And so we're going to need, we're dependent upon our brothers and sisters to be able to come alongside and say, hey, I love you. You're not doing this well. Yeah. That's a great and yes. So a key Tim talked about humility, right? Necessary to be humble, that you can receive that word and that you can confess that sin, even if that word has not been given to you yet. Oh, these are hard things, my beloved. These are things that I'm looking at your faces. Yeah, you all know it. You all know this. So this is not new, but is that how we're living? Do we live as interdependent people in the family of God at Christ Community Church? So um, let's do this really quickly. Personally, how are you dependent upon others? Give me some things for you. When you think about... (laughs) Take yourself outside of the body of Christ. You're alone. What are you missing? I remove you from this family. Matthew 18, maybe. You're out now. What are you missing? What do you need that you now do not have? Because that will reveal your understanding of interdependence. What is it, Tina? Accountability. Accountability. Huge. Top of, up there, right? What else? What's that? Encouragement. Encouragement. Who's going to encourage me to press on toward the goal to win the prize? Sarah? Friendships. Friendships. Christian friendships. How different that friendship is than a friendship with someone in the world, right? What else? What else are you missing personally? Family? Blood-bought family. Blood-bought. Brandon? Yeah? Yeah? So you're reading your Bible. It's you and your Bible and the Holy Spirit. And you may be way off, but you have no brother and sister to check you. You have no church to say, oh, that's outside of the pale of orthodoxy. Why'd you get there? How'd you get there? You say, I'm all alone. That's how I got there. You're not helping me. A frightful thing, right? When we exercise church discipline, we are casting someone out that they might be sifted by Satan and come back in. It's a horrible thing. And yet, I would say many of us in the Western church live as though we've been exercised, put our church discipline. We live like that, you know? An hour, an hour and a half on Sunday, that's the totality of our community. That's church discipline. That's Matthew 18. That's horrible. And yet we do that voluntarily. Uh, What's my time? Yeah, I can hit another one. Uh, How... 
we, we think about this in the context of being interdependent, I need you. But in the context of community, the other side of that co- coin is what? You need me. So how is your mindset, and even more importantly, how do your actions reflect the fact that you truly believe everybody in this room and everybody that's part of our larger church body needs you? They need you. So if, if it's easy to just go, oh, I'm tired this Sunday. Oh, I get, oh. If it's easy, then, then you're missing the point. Going back to what my mom said, if you're not present, it's kind of hard, right? But beyond that, what would give you an indication that you truly believe that others need you for their sanctification and perseverance? You acting in what way? What would that look like? For you. Uh, obviously, I'm not asking a good question. Mm-hmm. Good. Good. Someone says, will you pray for me? They're reflecting that. How, what, what initiative might you take? What forward action would you make if you truly believe that others need you? <laughs> How are you? How are you doing? How's your walk? How's your life? How's your marriage? How are your kids? How's the home? How, what's going on in your life? I mean, just being accessible to people, talking to them, loving them, praying for them, encouraging them. You initiating it because you look, you look around and you go, that one needs me, that one needs me, that one needs me. Not, I'm not talking about a Messiah complex. Don't go there. I'm talking about you as an individual member of the body of Christ realizing that other members need you just like you need them. We have a tendency in our selfishness to focus on us thinking we need others, but not so much others needing us. Um, regardless of what body parts you are, you are, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and the Apostle Paul, you are desperately needed. You're invaluable. Right? So does the church see that from you? Or are you more by yourself and isolated and we say things like, well, I'm shy, yeah, shy can be sinful too, right? Or I like to be alone, um, or I'm quiet, or I don't want to intrude, or I don't want to impose. Those are all just really sneaky Western ways of saying that I, I really don't think that I'm dependent upon you or you're dependent upon me. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12 paints a picture for us that is completely countercultural, right? This was a first century Mediterranean perspective in the culture and certainly in the context of the church but it is foreign to our culture and therefore in many ways it's foreign to our church agreed or disagreed yeah yeah okay Um, we cannot be a healthy biblical community if we do not see that we are interdependent one to another. Not, we're kinda, or a little bit, but truly interdependent. That we need each other desperately. Right? Okay, any questions on that? Can I, can I, can I do one more? Can we, can we get to uh, Ephesians 4? So, a, I'll go back up here really quickly. Authentic community is a devoted community. It's an interdependent, interconnected community. And I'll, we'll, do, we'll touch on Ephesians 4. Uh, hopefully you jotted something down for your inter, interdependent box on what you need to do to be more dependent on others and have them be more dependent upon you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, a building community. Authentic communities in the context of the church are churches that build up the church. Authentic community are, uh, communities are necessary for the building up and maturing of a local church to serve a greater purpose. That purpose is uh, Christ's work of filling all things might be brought to completion. That goes back to Ephesians chapter 1, 
uh, I think verse 10. So go there if you're not there already. Well, let me, let me, let me pause here. Are, are, you, are you feeling the right strain? I, there should be a pressure on you, a good pressure. Um, unless you are a communal person by, by upbringing, this just grates against us. When I went through this the first time, there were a handful of people in the church that loathed these teachings because we go, oh, that's not how I want to live. Oh, I can't, I can't even think about that. Uh, let me give you uh, a couple good quotes before we leave interdependent community. Uh, Keistermacher, who wrote a great commentary in Corinthians, he said this, the recipient of any gift, he's moving back up in verses uh, one through 11, the recipient of any gift must understand that all the members of the church depend upon him or her to exercise that spiritual gift. So the context of being interdependent, you got a gift given to you by God, you don't use it, we all suffer. Shame on you, right? That we need you to use your gift. He also said this, when all the members employ the talents the Holy Spirit has distributed to God's people, then the entire church functions efficiently for the benefit at all, and a loving watch care for one another will become, listen to this, the hallmark of the Christian community. That love for each other will rise above and we will be seen by that. Okay, okay so Ephesians chapter 4 the Apostle Paul, in, in chapters 1 through 3, he lays the theological foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ and how the church is brought up. Chapters, verses, chapters 4 through 6, he begins to develop what that looks like in application. In chapter 4, he's dealing with the unity in the body of Christ. So it parallels but expands a bit on 1 Corinthians 12. So I, again, I want to I work through this, and I want you to ask yourself this time, what are you doing to, be, to build up this church? We actually have it in our, in our membership covenant. What are you doing to use your gifts and talents to engage in ministry to build up the body of Christ here if you're a member at Christ Community Church? You're devoted to the teachings, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. You realize that you're an interdependent part of this church. You are needed and they need you to use your gifts. And now, are you, do you have your contractor's belt on? Are, are you working to build up the body of Christ here? Um, and so uh, Paul picks up in chapter four of Ephesians and he begins to talk about certain gifts, um, offices actually, that are given to the church for particular purposes. So let's, let's work through this quickly and then we'll, and then we'll, we'll close. Um, verse 11, and he, speaking of God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So let me just step, step back there. So these gifts that are given, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, are given to the church, verse 12, for what purpose? To equip the saints, that's the body of Christ, for the work of ministry, for working in the church. Now immediately, that runs contrary to many of the church structures that polities in the West, right? In the West, many churches, what are, their, what are their church polities look like? Who does the work of ministry? The pastor, pastors, deacons, ministry leaders, staff, they do the work, and then the church comes along and participates a little bit. Um, I would argue that that is a, a bad ecclesiology. Right. Our a biblical ecclesiology is that pastors and teachers are given to the church to equip the church to engage in the work of ministry. Right. So when someone says, you know, I'm going, I, I'm thinking about going into ministry. I'm like, well, what are you doing now? What, what do you mean? I'm going into ministry. You're you're in ministry. If you're a Christian, you're in ministry. The question is, are you doing the ministry? Not are you in it? Are you out it? Right. Are you actually doing it? Um, verse 12, so to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. It's an incredible picture here. For the body of Christ to actually grow up in Christ. And then here's the goal. Look at verse 13, the progressive nature. Until we all, speaking of every member, 
we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's a very complicated way of saying that the, the, the pastors today, because that's really, and teachers today, are to equip the church to build one another up in unity of the faith, in the knowledge of God, and in the maturity of the fullness of Christ. Right, that we all grow together. And then we're told why, verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human coming, cunning, by craftiness and defeat, deceitful schemes. Rather, instead of being immature, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, so there's a, a means by which we help each other grow. We speak the truth in love to each other. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So the maturity is as Christ is. We're his body, he's the head. We want to have a matching correspondence there verse 16 from whom the whole body so Christ is both the source the whole body joined and um, held together he makes us he sustains us by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love picture of the church is very different in Ephesians 4, then we see outside. When If someone outside the church were to say to you, what is the purpose of your church? Would you move to an Ephesians 4 perspective? You say, well, what's, what's your responsibility in that church? So uh, I'm supposed to be building that church up. I'm supposed to be serving and loving and working to make that church, the bride of Christ, the most beautiful, the most holy, the most radiant bride I can. Right? That's your job if you're a member of a local church. Um, the standard is crazy. The standard is what? The standard is Christ. Right? That we're to mature in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So the standard is perfection. It's Jesus uh, and that we are to do that, and that happens. Notice the latter part of verse 16, probably one of the most convicting parts of this passage. When each part is what? Is working properly, together. Which means what? If each part is not, then what's happening? And we'll get, get, these are just leveling statements for us, my beloved. If we're, if we're saying... Every single member, gifted by God, member of the body of Christ, is, needs to work to build up the church, to work properly to build up the church, and a member, or two, or 10, or 50, or 100 or not, well, what's happening with that church? Is it being built up? No, it's not. Now that's, that, that's, that's very detrimental for models that say we're gonna have a few pastors and a few ministry leaders and we're gonna pay them to build up the church where the rest of the body, you know, the degree to which they build up the church is showing up on Sunday for an hour and a half. That runs contrary to Ephesians 4. That's a bad ecclesiology. Brandon. So you, you just described a producer-consumer mentality. Well, would you agree that in the, in the Western church, for the most part, it's consumer rather than producer? I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm gonna be fed, I'm gonna sing. Well, that's giving, I'm singing. They can hear my beautiful voice that I sing to God. Or is it, is it, I'm going to, I'm going to serve. I'm gonna work, I'm gonna love, I'm gonna minister. Right? I'm gonna build up. Do you see is in your mindset, in your biblical worldview, do you see your responsibility for building up the church? 
for working and serving and loving and ministering and making disciples and sharing the gospel and doing whatever you can, if you're a member here, to make the body of Christ at Christ Community Church the most beautiful, radiant example of the bride of Christ on earth. Do you pray about that? Do you think about it? Do you say, what am I going to do next week to grow the church? What am I going to do this year to build up the body of Christ? How am I going to do that? Guaranteed, if there's no thought about it, then you're probably not doing much of it. And if there's no plan to it, then there's probably not a lot of building up that you're doing. And the problem is, if you get a lot of people in the same church thinking like that and living like that, then the church does not get built up, right? A church that stays stagnant runs contrary to Ephesians 4. The picture of the church is one of progressive sanctification for the whole body. Not just you or me or a handful of others, but for the whole body. So what, what, what do we do with this? Every member is supposed to work. Every member is supposed to work to build up the body. Everybody, every member is supposed to work to build up the body until we reach unity and faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, the, the perfection being Christ himself. Well, that means how long do we have to work? How long? Until the end. Until Christ comes or you go to see him, right? Because we're, are we there yet? Have we reached the maturity? We're not even close, right? And we're not going to be close. We're going to keep working. Now, to encourage you, in one sense, we already have it completely in Christ, right? In one sense, we are perfect in Christ. That's the, the not yet part. But the already now is that we need to keep growing. And so the picture here is one of, of, of corporate thought, not me, my Bible, the Holy Spirit, maybe me and my wife, maybe me and my children. That's, that's about as big as we like to get. Well, I'm taking care of my family. Well, there's another family that you're part of. Are you building that family up? Are you praying for that family and serving that family? So just give me some comments on that in terms of that picture. Do you, how, what's your response to that? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't know that I'm doing much to build up the body. <laughs> well, I will. You may have to give your answer. Um, as Brandon was talking, I, I was quickly remembering people I had known in my years um, in churches and ministry who um, I think started off holistically in, in the way that we're talking about it. Mm-hmm. In Uh. I mean, what you were bringing up before, very, very, wrote, very transactional, and it, and it became a, a thin veneer of what was really going on deeper in their heart. But to the rest of the body, we, we really didn't see that erosion, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. Which we've talked about with this interdependentness of the church family. Right? Yeah. But, but still, you know, that uh, I think that's very common um, in the healthiest of churches. You have, Agreed. You have Yep. When, when it's acting to quite contrary. Yeah. So, um, and that, that was really good what, what you said, Brandon, but um, it, that, that's something, too, within this that has to do with hypervigilant against, guarding against. Yeah. And just saying, hey, how you doing? Do you need anything? It, it's easy for someone like me, especially, because uh, Tim, Tim nailed mine. So, w- once again, Tim has crystallized my thoughts exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's socialism, right? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, most of you can identify that idea of coming in, maybe, and, and being encouraged and hungry, and then, you know, time passes. And, and oftentimes we don't do it consciously. We just get into ruts, and we get into habits, and Sundays come, and Sundays go, and then years pass, right? And the impact, though, it's not just on you. It's the bride of Christ, Right? And so if we can do anything to elevate our love for the bride, this is, Jesus is going to come back for his bride. And so we, um, <laughs> for those of you who have been involved in wedding planning or you know, the finalization of those days, right, there's so much that goes into, I remember for uh, Kirk and Sarah's wedding, that you know, um, with the focus rightly being upon Sarah as the bride and all that went into the preparation of that, 
um, to make that, that wedding ceremony the best that it could be and the most God-honoring that it could be. Um, when you think of the body of Christ as the bride of Christ, are you, are, are you working on the veil? You know, and are you spending time making sure that you know, the ring is going to be at the ceremony? Just all those things in the context. And the, the simple piece is, really, it's the one anothering that as you grow someone else in Christ and help them grow, and as they help grow you, the body gets built up. As you pray for them and they pray for you, and as you minister to them, as you share the gospel with them or, or, or teach the Bible to them, you're growing them up, the body grows up. So the corporate mindset is one, I guess I shouldn't even use that word corporate because that we default to a bad place here. Um, it is the right word. Uh, the, yeah, communal, the communal body, building up the communal body, it, it has to be something at the forefront of our minds. And, and asking yourself, am I, am I even interested in that? Am I, am I participating in it? Tina, go ahead. Yeah. Agreed. Good. Yeah, we would definitely argue that that membership is essential to that. So do this for me. Um, if you didn't jot something down, do so now. Um, and we'll talk briefly and we'll close. I can be a member who helps build up the body of Christ, the body at Christ Community Church by by what? Going back to what Brandon said, if you identify more as a consumer than a producer, then building up in Ephesians 4 is probably low on your list. Over the years, we've had lots of people visit, hundreds of people visit, maybe thousands now. And it's funny as they're talking to me, I'm hearing consumption, consumption, consumption. And I'm trying to think of a time when someone came in and said, how can I serve this church? <laughs> what can I do to grow this body? I probably would fall over dead on the spot. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, and this is how we think in our culture, and so we think like this in the church. It's what can I get rather than what can I give. Uh, Paul flips that on its head in Ephesians 4. He's asking, what can you give to grow the bride? You'll be blessed in that. You'll be blessed but the mindset is different. So what can you do? What can you do? I'm not, I don't, don't give me that really good theological answer. What can you do to build up this church? Maybe do that you're not doing, maybe do better that you're not doing so well. And we're, we're gonna be done for the night, so we'll close on a few thoughts and a few prayers on this. What can you do? So give you a quick example. Um, we're having the stairs done. <laughs> you probably noticed the dust. Um, my brother is the contractor. His employee did not show up Monday, Tuesday. So I come in, I'm like, man, what's going on? He said, well, he wasn't here. So less building on the stairs because his employee was not working. It's the same with the body of Christ. What can you do? Be very practical with me here. And these are going to obviously overlap with some of the things you've already said, very likely. Oh, that's great, Morgan. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> you're talking about using gifts and talents to serve? Yeah, maybe you are serving, 
but you're serving out of necessity because no one else is, but you're really gifted to do something else, right? So go find that person in the church that's gifted to do what you're doing, grab them and say, you need to do this because I'm supposed to be doing that. That's good, I like that. So being aware of the gifts and talents God's given us. Are you using them? Excellent, good job. Brand? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does Brandon sound harsh? Is that a harsh statement? I, I'm being serious. He's talking about going up to someone, seeing a gift, and saying, you have this gift, we need it here, you need to use that. Is that harsh? No. It's not at all. It's not at all. So for those of you, we had, I was one of four boys, I had three boys, we all had things to do at certain times. Dinner time, before dinner, after dinner, there were always things to do. And if someone wasn't doing it, it wasn't just me or my wife, the other brothers would say, hey, so-and-so, you should be doing this. Right? We do that all the time in natural families. In the supernatural family of God, that, of course, it needs to be done in love and humility and grace, but it's not okay for you to have a gift or talent and not use it. In fact, we're going to look at that. That's given to you by God. You're to be a good steward of it. You're going to give an account for it. And so a brother or sister talking to you about it, it's just helping you with that stewardship accountability before you see Jesus, which is a good thing. You don't want to say, why didn't anybody tell me? Lord, I didn't know. Not going to fly. So, not harsh. <laughs> Nobody's answering. But yeah, yeah, we're okay with, we're okay with that? All right, so let's have some of these dialogues. In the next month, I want you talking to say, hey, you know what? I see this in you. It's extraordinary. It's God-given. What are you doing with it? How are you using it to shape the body of Christ? You say, oh, I don't know. Well, help them. Help them. Tina. Good. 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 Correct. Good. Yeah, responding to that and listening to brothers and sisters. The church, the body's going to get it right. We get it right. You get a, you get a gathering of, of people indwelt by the Holy Spirit, they're going to see things very clearly. You go, oh, yeah, absolutely. You should be serving like that. So we're okay with it not being optional. That's what I'm hearing. So I, we haven't said a word. We, we, we're quiet. <laughs> okay. All right. Give me a couple more and we'll close. What, what, what are you can do? What can you do? What are you going to do to help build this church up? Jonathan. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So just being together doesn't build up. It may draw you closer, but doesn't necessarily build up. Being together well, as Jonathan just described, will help build up.
being vulnerable, you confessing, you sharing, giving them an opportunity to do that with you. Yeah, doors just get blown wide open when that kind of stuff starts happening. All right. Okay. All right. So you have three that in order for authentic biblical community, we have to be a devoted people to the Word of God, to true biblical fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We need to understand that we truly are interdependent, that we need each other. That's not just something we say, but we actually live in accordance with that. You live in the body needing others, and you live in the body with others needing you, and then that plays itself out in our lives. And that we are going to be intentional about building up the church here. That if the church, if our church is the exact same spiritually, I'm not talking numerically. I know that's where the West goes. I think that, yeah, I won't go there. Um, If we're in the exact same place a year from now spiritually, we each should be asking ourselves, well, what have I done to build up the church? If, if I haven't done anything, and I can probably multiply that by another you know, 20 people, then we really, we really shouldn't have an expectation of our church being much different a year from now than we are today. But that's, that's not honoring to Christ, and it's certainly contrary to what the scriptures clearly teach. Right? If Christ is the head and he's the perfection and he's the mature man and we're to grow into that, then every church can say we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> right? every, every good, healthy church has a lot of work to do. Okay. Um, let me go back here just to show you. So closing, closing thoughts for you. Any questions or, or concerns? Or, so we, we made it through. We made it through three of the five. General thoughts on this, and then, and then I, I will close, I promise. I'll pray and, I'll, and you'll, we'll go. But give me some general thoughts. You love it. A light to the community in which we live and a light within the community that we are a part of. Good. Thank you. William. I'm going to be praying for um, I have no idea for Kyle, Tristan, and whoever is helping me. I didn't realize he was here. And didn't know he was here. Well, he was here today. So, oh, so yeah, 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 he was here today. Yeah. yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah. I would hope there'd be some excitement. The thought being, there's a beautiful picture painted for us in the Word of God of how we can experience intimacy now before we see Christ. Right? It's, it, it'll be perfect in the presence of the Lord. We won't have to be talking about this because we will be doing it. But hopefully that we have that picture and we say, yeah, I, I want to participate in that. I want to work to that. I want to help my brothers and sisters work to that. And, uh, and how great if a year from now we could say, wow, you know, we are, at, spiritually speaking, we are a much different church than we were a year ago. We are. We've, we've, we've built ourselves up by the power of Christ in many ways. And then we're going to keep doing that. Right? Hopefully some conviction thinking, wow, that's really not how I live, how I think. Confess that to God. Ask him to give you right thinking. And right feelings, right desires, right? He want, we want them to replace our fleshly desires. Um, I hope that it's not, so this is where I go, it's not possible. It's not possible here. I just, you know, I, my default is it's the West. It doesn't look like this. We don't live like this. No one thinks like this. So pray for me because my, that, that skeptic just raises up its ugly head and says, uh, what does it matter? Why do we keep talking about this? Because we're never going to get there. Well, we're never going to get there on this side, but we can make a good headway, right? All right, let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. Um, Thank you for these key passages. 
um, where you have revealed to us the devotion that a true community has, the interdependence um, that a, a body of believers have, and, and the call for each of us to participate in, in building uh, this church up, Father. I, I ask that you would do that, that you would give us a desire to experience real, authentic, biblical community, true one anothering, Father, that we, we don't have to work so hard because we love you and we love Christ so much and we have your love in us and the Spirit in us that, that we will begin to do these things supernaturally by your Spirit. I, I pray that um, you would help us to that end. Um, I pray, Lord, that you would take tonight, that you would bless our time tonight, that you would take these words from your Scripture and that you would impress them upon our hearts and minds. And, and even tonight, Father, uh, make us more communal. Make us more intimate with one another. I thank you so much for bringing so many of my brothers and sisters out that we might discuss this tonight. As my mom said, if we weren't here, we could even talk about it. And yet, we're thankful that you brought us here. Um, I pray, Lord, for those who are unable to be here, um, that you would, by your spirit, bless them with the same wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for coming.